Monica Gandhi, <laughs> welcome back. We just launch right into it. I'm very happy to be here. You look beautiful as always. I went to India and I got all these Indian dresses and I have my bindi. You know, <laughs> bapri, <bhai>. <laughs> I just really got Indian. It was great. It was five weeks in India. So you went, you spent five weeks. My, as we've talked about on this program before, my husband had passed right before the pandemic and we were putting his ashes in oh. the Ganges in Varanasi. It was a very beautiful experience. And then went all over India. It was, I think, through their BA275 wave, but they were done with COVID. So everyone was sniffling around us. And um, it was uh, it was a very beautiful experience. Oh, and did your kids come with you too? Yes, yes. The so they all got that that closure of being there closure and a, maybe we'll talk about this at the end a lot yeah. of kind of spiritual discussion a lot of like being right in it i mean if you're in benares that is that's, that the, is epicenter. that's the, the heart of it you know what's funny so when i was young i was a hardcore atheist and that's when i went to india is with my parents and they took me in when i was a teenager and something about India, it, it, you're, you're seeped in it. You're seeped in it. It's, it I couldn't describe God's it. Everywhere. It's God's no everywhere. To, God is everywhere. God is everywhere. You can't get away from it. It's just God soaked. That's what it so is. So because of that, you come back. And you changed. know what's funny? I told my grandfather, my maternal grandfather at the time, I said, you know, I, I, I'm an atheist. I'm about science. Yeah. And he said, um, oh yeah, I was too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, that'll change. And yeah. I'm like, oh, but it's just because you're getting old and you're going to die. No, it's not that. Yeah. Because there's no doubt. Yeah. He just looked at me at my 14 year old self. He says, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. And it, and that's what the experience of that spirituality is. It's an experience. It's not a belief. It's a deep knowing. And India is steeped in it. Yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. My my just as one comment, my my son, my twelve year old, was in Varanasi after an arti, and he looked up at the sky and he saw this thin crescent of the moon, and he saw the metaphor of that being the comb and Shiv uh, Shiva's hair, and just like the water stemming from that and falling, the Ganges falling from that, and he saw he just burst into tears. He said, "Mommy, I saw God," and I said, um, "I'm glad it was here." So oh. yeah, it was very beautiful. That's so beautiful. It how how beautiful. old is he He's again? Twelve. Oh, and we went back to the hotel, and he couldn't stop crying. He said it was it was beautiful. He 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 truly saw that image, um, and he and it's changed him. He's he's oh. he's a very nice little boy. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I can't even do the interview now. Yeah, that's so <laughs> now awesome. Now we have to talk about now, now we have to talk about. <laughs> The, the triple demic. I know. All we, right. we got to move over. So Okay. All right. Well, we'll move. Okay. I'll compose myself and we'll move to what we're going to talk about. So I'll just let the, the folks know. We're going to hit RSV flu COVID. We're going to hit uh, China's response to COVID. We're going to hit mm, pox, 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 <laughs> mm, pox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, nice name change. We're going to hit uh, your new book that's going to be coming out yes. about the pandemic playbook. Yes. And learning from what we've learned here and applying your HIV AIDS experience. To it. Could yeah. have done it before. I wish we had. But yeah, bringing HIV into the response Absolutely. to any pandemic. Absolutely. And then we'll end with a little more uh, spirituality. That sounds good. <laughs> all right. So RSV flu COVID is is all the news right now. This idea that there are three circulating respiratory viruses and then some rhinoviruses and enteroviruses that were at tail end of summer. What's going on? Oh, I, we know hospitals are as busy as they've been in terms of those viruses. Let's talk about this because there's so much misunderstanding. People are talking about immune debt. We've somehow damaged our immune systems by not exposing ourselves to the normal pathogens. But what's really going on here? I think it's super simple. It's just two things are going on. One is that no, immunity debt, maybe we shouldn't use that word because it that sounds like by staying away from pathogens, we're no longer able to respond to pathogens. That's not true. Yeah. If you have not seen RSV for two years, and we have no vaccine to RSV yet, we're getting one, then your antibodies and your exposure to respiratory syncytial virus RSV go down. So children especially, neonates who are born of mothers who haven't seen RSV for two years, and then children, older children, they haven't seen RSV, which gives them the immunity to fight it better the next year. And so then they're very susceptible to RSV as it comes roaring back 
for the second reason, which we'll talk about. And so RS, we're just less, we're just more susceptible to it. Right. So, so we have more RSV in the hospital. So, we're so more we, prone more to prone severe to disease. It's almost like we took something that normally happens, yeah. which isn't great when it does happen in the sense that new, newborns in particular are quite susceptible yes, to the- they can get very sick. Yeah. Very sick. And so what we did is we just delayed that. But when we, we delayed it in a way where when it comes back, it's hitting with the delayed RSV. It's also hitting with the delayed flu. And because of things we're gonna talk about, viral interference, yes, it, yes. typical respiratory pathogens, and the fact that we've changed our behavior. So when schools were closed, people are masking, there's distancing, that kind of we thing. We stayed away from each other. Everyone keeps on marveling, oh, I didn't have a cold for two and a half years. That's right. But they didn't have RSV, they didn't have influenza, they didn't have adenovirus, they didn't have coronavirus, human metanumavirus, parainfluenza, all the usual respiratory pathogens. And then if you don't see viruses that you don't have, uh, vaccines too, then you, you have no way to fight it. Your immune system is not there to fight it. And so, yeah, we're seeing more severe uh, RSV. Two good things happening is that one is that the RSV has definitely peaked and coming down in this country. Yeah. And second is that we do have a monoclonal antibody for very susceptible children. And we have vaccines coming out next fall for pregnant women to protect neonates and older people. Because they these extremes of age have always been more affected by respiratory pathogens, right. except for COVID, which really spared young children. It was a bizarre aspect blessedly, of COVID. Blessedly, yeah. Yeah, blessedly. Yeah, yeah. And then influenza, same thing. Also coming back, didn't see it last season, didn't see it two seasons in a row, so we don't have the immunity against it. Right. Our influenza rate, vaccination rates aren't as high as usual because I think we need do need to talk about trust in public health at some point Absolutely. when we get into the book. Yep. And so people aren't, we're at 40% influenza vaccination rate right now, which isn't great. And that, that we could try to do better with. And so because of that, you haven't seen influenza, so you don't have the antibodies or the T cells or B cells from last year to protect you. So more severe influenza. Good thing about that, also coming down, reached our peak coming down. Now, viral interference is very important to talk about because yeah. this isn't just in COVID that we had papers on this. For years, essentially one virus, if it's circulating at high levels and it's one type of virus, like a respiratory pathogen, kicks the other um, viruses out of the, play, uh, out of the playground. Mm -hmm. And so essentially... COVID's been it for two and a half years. It's been circulating at very high levels. And now we have such high degrees of population immunity to COVID, it can no longer dominate our world. And so nature abhors a vacuum and these other viruses are coming in. So we had a 95% uh, spike antibody rate uh, this was advertised in March of 2022 by the CDC. I feel like no one noticed it, but they put out a seroprevalence survey that 95% of Americans have IgG to the spike protein. It means either we've gotten vaccinated or we've seen the virus. Right. 95%. It's, it's as good as you can get. We have such high rates of immunity. Yeah. It's why since March of 2022, we've seen very little severe disease in the hospital. That's right. The media is obviously reporting this incorrectly because we swab everyone in the hospital. They have COVID in their nose. They're there for another reason. Looks like hospitalizations are going up. And you can see this split in the media. Most Some media, CNN actually said the other day, this is because we're swabbing too many people. The CDC told us to stop asymptomatic swabbing in the hospital on September 23rd. Mm -hmm. And we still haven't stopped yeah. in 50% of our hospitalizations. So CNN is reporting accurately. New York Times and Washington Post is not. And they're saying hospitalizations are going up. So they're not. So I have a piece with... Um, an ER doctor from uh, Southern California coming out in time on Monday, where we call it COVID optimism, really talking about how little severe disease there is. So COVID pneumonias, people in the ICUs, ARDS people who need yeah. ARDX, yeah. dexamethasone. It's so much lower. So such high levels of population immunity to COVID means these other viruses come in to fill that vacuum, viral interference, and RSV and influenza really came in. And so did adenovirus and other coronaviruses, the common cold causing ones. Right, they're all back. And I think one of the speculations around what is the mechanism of viral interference, we don't fully know because it's complex, but maybe there's an interferon component. So when you're with ah. one virus, there's interferon release, and that actually has a general protective effect against other viruses. But some media has spun it as, oh, but we've actually seen COVID suppresses immunity. So maybe it was the recent COVID infections that have made us prone to RSV and, and this kind of thought. Well, what's your thinking on that? That is really a very dangerous um, statement to make because uh, coronavirus is an RNA virus, right? It's not a retrovirus like HIV. HIV is a 
RNA virus that gets made into DNA in the body and then it stays in your body. And it's why we can have chronic inflammation and we can't cure HIV except in very rare cases. And that stays in the body and then it happens to infect very cleverly, unfortunately, CD4 cells, which are our immune system. That's why if you don't get on treatment, you can really have opportunistic infections, severe infections. Coronavirus is a RNA virus. It doesn't stay in the body long term. It doesn't damage T cell immunity. And there's paper after paper showing that if you get exposed to COVID, you expand your T cell repertoire, you expand your B cells to fight the virus. And this is, we've known about RNA viruses forever. And then there's six other coronaviruses. It's not like COVID is this brand new virus. There's four common circulating cold causing coronaviruses. There's MERS. There's SARS, so that's six, and then there's SARS-CoV-2. So it's acting like any other coronavirus. Fundamentally, when you get enough immunity to it, in the population, severe disease goes away. And we're always going to have COVID, but it will cause mild infections and will probably boost vulnerable people every winter to give them that increased immunity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So my 87-year-old father should get a um, a boost every winter. Now, and this is an important distinction. So a boost for the very fragile who even if they yes. got an adenovirus, it could knock them over. Into, exactly. My right? 87, 88 year old father who went through B cell lymphoma treatment, I wouldn't want him to get an adenovirus either, but I'd have no way to control that. Meaning right. no there's vaccine. no vaccine for that. But I'm very lucky in the world of coronavirus to give him a boost every winter. And then he could get Paxlovid if he needed it. So we also don't realize how much incredible progress we've made in coronavirus. Someone said, um, I was on NPR the other day talking about RSV. Someone called in and said, give me COVID any day uh, over RSV. I was really flattened by RSV. Yeah. I and know. that's the stage in the pandemic we are. That's where we are. And, and again, vulnerable young people and old people get RSV as well. Yes. And and we don't have a great armamentarium, like you said, a monoclonal. And or a drug, a drug or a medication uh, that we can give for RSV. Exactly. And I hope COVID will make us have better treatments for other, for other RNA viruses. Exactly. Now, one thing I just want to circle back quickly, because you said it in, in passing a couple of times, is that pregnant um, women, when they are vaccinated for certain things or they're exposed to RSV, et cetera, what they're benefiting their newborn with is those breast milk passed or placenta passed antibodies. antibodies. Yeah. So, and that's what is roughly a six month duration of those. Exactly. So you're protecting your very vulnerable newborn by you know vaccinating mom or mom being normally exposed to RSV. Exactly. Mom being in a position to handle RSV a lot better than say a newborn. Yes. I'm not saying go out and get infected, but I'm saying that's one of the explanations why we're seeing so much. Because now. mothers were not exposed to RSV exactly. over the last two and a half years and so they don't have antibodies to pass to their very vulnerable neonates now. Exactly right. And then that's why the vaccine that's coming out in in, in September, I think, will um, that vaccine was for pregnant women for RSV. Yeah. And they'll take it to give immunity to their newborn. Now to circle back to the bivalent booster, say, uh, we're not talking about kids. We're not talking about college students. We're not talking about healthy middle-aged people. We're talking about the extreme vulnerable elderly. Exactly. That's what the WHO said. I know the U.S. has given a different message. They actually just approved yesterday giving boosters to six months uh, olds and onward. I doubt the uptake will be very high. It won't Just be, like yeah. the uptake hasn't been high in five to 11 year olds, yeah. even 12 year olds. I, I, I explain it very simply. I have a 12 and a 14 year old and I have an 80, 88 and an 82 year old mother. My Older parents got the bivalent. I didn't because I don't need it. Yep. And my 12 and 14 year old didn't even need the third shot. So they got their two shots. That's so right. you just, it's called age stratified risk. Mm-hmm. And it's its so profound in COVID, even more than any other virus, that we need to make our booster recommendations appropriate. very appropriate. appropriate. WHO said that. They said, um, don't boost everyone every winter. What a waste. Yeah. Just do vulnerable people every winter. We're going to do that from now on. And, and, and remember this boosting every winter, that, that's distracting and confusing to people who aren't even getting flu shots. Yes. Which trust. actually- This yeah, is right? your trust. And what's your take on flu shot? We ought to be getting it, right? Yes. So in fact, I got it. And of course we have to get it in healthcare and I got it for my children. But I think that flu, because we're, we have such low immunity now yeah. to influenza over the last two and a half years, very safe vaccine, six months and up. I think everyone should get the flu vaccine. Yeah. And 
It's but we're not seeing people all get the flu vaccine. We even aren't seeing people give their children measles or polio vaccine. All this reaction to our this public is health public fiasco. health trust, and and that's the other thing is that public health should look at themselves and say, okay, what did I do wrong with my one size fits all, mm. my non nuanced messaging that got people to distrust me, as opposed to saying, oh, Americans are so anti science, they're so anti vaccine, they're so wrong. That's not a very good way to kind of. Uh, look at yourself and say, what went wrong? Yeah. So when polio, you know, that case of paralytic polio, paralytic polio in July in New York, and then the circulating polio in the wastewater and low rates of polio vaccination in New York, and then the Ohio ongoing outbreak of measles, 95% among unvaccinated children, we should take a hard look at ourselves and say, okay, what, um, where do we go wrong with our one size fits all messaging? Your six month old needs a boost? No. The older people need a boost, and that's where we have to go because also we could concentrate on that population. Yeah. And it's kind of actually like MPOX. If we concentrated on gay men, that's appropriate yeah. to scare the entire population and say, when school's open, you're all going to die. That was very inappropriate messaging by some public health people, people with loud voices on Twitter and also uh, in mainstream media. Yeah, exactly. Uh, instead of you focusing on the populations at risk is good public health. So- yeah, and I think what's interesting is there's still so much confusion and, and heartache here in the Bay Area, especially. You know, I just got an email from a, a woman who's a lawyer, parents are doctors, watched our show for a long time, and their kid is in a theatrical group. And the theater company said all kids in this group in order to perform need to be fully boosted up to current CDC oh, wow. recommendations. Oh, wow, that could be up to five shots. Exactly. And this parent was like, that is insane. This and kid they had know Omicron, it. they, they know, know it, it. they yeah. all know it. And so this is unscientific. And what it does, it creates a backlash. Now that same family is gonna start to be much more receptive to hearing ideas that maybe even the standard childhood vaccines are an overreach. Exactly. You know, and, and they're not, but this is what's gonna happen and we're seeing it. And so flu vaccine, forget about it. People are like, I'm not gonna do that. Exactly, 40% yeah. flu vaccine rate when we're having a raging flu yeah, like, season it's, is very, very worrisome. And you have to take a hard look at yourself. Yeah. But mainstream media is still saying, oh, um, just as recently as yesterday, rethink your holiday gathering. Yeah. You know, like it's amazing. Like right. we have a we have a tool, which is a flu vaccine. Talk about that, but 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 after three years of keeping people apart, the mental health effects are so clear that also could be playing into this. People have mental health effects. It's very oh, anxiety, a, depression. Oh, we're creating this social yeah. contagion and anxiety and people have been alone and it's it's horrible. And being scared of of people breathing. Right. You Which, know, so amazing. That was so different than in HIV where you'd say, okay, if you're at risk here, I'm gonna just tell you how to stay safe. Go ahead, do whatever you want. Here, I think you should use condoms. Go ahead and do whatever you want, harm reduction. Yeah. And then, oh wait, treatments came out. Do whatever you want. You don't need a condom. Like treatments came out. That actually reduces your viral load to the point that you can't pass it on. I love these treatments. I love the prevention. And I keep on thinking mainstream media right now has not embraced the vaccines. They're not extolling the vaccines as the key to right. normal life. Right. They've been, even though the vaccines have been out since January, 2021, we're still seeing messages two years later the only way to keep safe is stay away from each other or test before you go to the party. Yeah. Instead of the vaccines unlock that key. Right. And to then, normal life. And, and, and guess Two what? Two years later. P P you've been saying that since the vaccines came out yeah. on my show. And n it's just like weird. Oh, but then the but then you see in the media, but there's more cases and then there's this. Okay, where where are the deaths? Yeah. Yeah, where are the, where's the severe disease? And we've been talking about it. And there's a wall. Focus on that population. Focus on that population. And it's actually quite a low rate of severe disease now. We're again, conflating, miscategorizing hospitalizations by swabbing everybody. By swabbing everybody. But it's actually very low. I've seen it, I'm, I work in a hospital. That's right. And yeah. now speaking of um, things that have gone terribly wrong, China. Uh, so China had a policy that was touted as extremely effective. They basically said, anytime there's evidence of, of COVID positivity, shut the entire community down, swab everybody, PCR everybody, keep them locked in their houses, literally. And they can do that because they're China. Unless uh, there's a fire and unless then they there's die. A fire and they die and then the people go, wait, we've been tortured for how many years? And it's fine if the economy's going, it's fine if I can make a living, it's fine if my mental health is intact, but it's no longer. So they go into the streets and protest, which is unheard of. Mass protests, yes. Unheard of. But now they got what they wanted to some degree. And I'm reading that now they're scared because they've been so conditioned that COVID is a terror. Instead it, of clean, data-based, age-stratified, 
database messaging. It's so clean. It could be so clean. You are very at risk uh, if you're 80 and above. Actually, less at risk even being 60 and above. 80 and above is the highest. Right. So, I mean, it gave you, make sure that you're all vaccinated and boosted in the 80 and above first, then 70 and above, then 60 and above. And 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 we're gonna we're gonna protect you with these vaccines, and, and, and you're gonna be okay. So they they got abysmal uptake in the elderly, even for Sinovac, which is the Chinese vaccine, which is not, I understand, as robust a protection. Maybe not as mRNA, be, right. but it's still better than nothing. Better I actually nothing, yeah. think it's the mRNA vaccines are profoundly important because they're very good for immunocompromised because they produce such high levels of protein. Right. That even if you're immunocompromised, there's this narrative in the news right now that immuno, we're throwing immunocompromised right, under right, the bus. Right, right, so, so That's do, so untrue. These vaccines work beautifully. I work with an immunocompromised population. They they um, work beautifully in immunocompromised. But older, but the, but the whole virus vaccines um, that show you the whole virus, they're okay, they're good. Just give three doses. Right, for right, elderly. right, right. And so, and, and so that hasn't really been done. So instead China's been just moving the football out and now they have this elderly population that's at risk. In, very in, little natural immunity. Very little natural immunity. And now the piper's gonna have to be paid. So, I mean, what would you recommend if you were advising the Chinese government? Uh, you know those, um, I don't know if you've seen those pictures of those awful uh, isolation bunks. Yeah. Like what, just miles and miles of little white barracks and they've just been kept alone in a barrack if you had a positive test. So um, dismantle those and I would just definitely use these as vaccination sites ah. and start with 80 and above who are the, most at risk. So um, um, here you, you know, here's here's the vast vaccination campaign. Please come down here. We'll give you the vaccine. Uh, and then we're going to give you the booster uh, so that you have three shots and, uh, ever, and we're going to do it in a stage fashion, then over 70, over 60. Then you're, then you're really safe when you have your over 60 year olds all vaccinated and boosted because there was a piece in Lancet on March 11th, 2022, that showed that we've had 6.6 .6 million deaths from COVID across the planet as the two year anniversary of the pandemic and probably up to, to 12 million deaths from the collateral damage of lockdowns, the cardiovascular deaths, cancer deaths, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. And so, but the, and that paper showed the strongest in any country, it doesn't matter if they mass, it doesn't matter if they lock down, the, the strongest protector against lower COVID mortality is vaccinating and boosting your elderly. Yeah. That's it, 60 and above. So then you're free to go when you have really have the highest rates that you can in 60 and above. And then everyone else can mill and be around each other. And then in time, try to vaccinate others. But right. you just know that you've saved the population that's most at and risk. And those individuals can determine risk for themselves. They can say, okay, my risk is this. I can it's get vaccinated, decision, I can yeah. wear a mask or not. I can do this or that. Yeah. But but it, it, can't, it doesn't need to be compelled and it doesn't need to be shamed by the the media or by public health officials. Yes. And it doesn't need to be divided based on blue and red states. And it doesn't, need, I mean, it's all madness. <sighs> yeah, we did it out. here in that polarized blue red state way. And and fundamentally, I they keep on thinking Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, or as left as they get, right? They're very left. Right. But they never had this response. They, they didn't have the blue state response in our country. They said, vaccines unlock the key of normal life. Once we give you guys the vaccine, you can wear a mask, but you don't have to, it's totally up to you. Stop mass mandates, stop lockdowns, stop capacity limits. Denmark did that in, in very early on after the mass rollout of the vaccine. And they've been living normally for quite a long time now. Yeah. Since the time when we could have been living normally, which is around the beginning of 2022, after the BA1 wave, that's when we have so much immunity that people are very safe. Yeah, yeah. And um, okay, so what are the lessons then? Because then you have, Monkeypox, I'm sorry, Mpox. <laughs> and the messaging around this was equally sort of <laughs> disadvantageous to actually having an outcome that you want, which is not so much fear, yes, good outcomes for the targeted population at risk. Yes, I mean, I wrote a book on on COVID and it's called Endemic. And, and one of its big themes is why did the media go to such fear-based messaging? Mm. And I have three thoughts about that. One was for compliance, to help increase compliance with mask wearing, with vaccination, with whatever I think the media wanted. Um, the second, I think, was anti-Trump. So yeah. um, Trump said open schools, so the media said closed schools because they were very anti-Trump. Right. And then um, the third was clickbait, just people, you know, just will read your stories if you say something scary. Yeah. So the MPOX outbreak worldwide, May 2nd was the first report 
to the WHO occurring in the UK with a gay man that had not traveled to West and Central Africa and was very surprising. And then there was this relationship between these two big raves in Spain and Belgium. And then very quickly, it was clear it was mostly among gay men. And I don't mean mostly, I mean like 98% right. to 99%, mostly among men. And absolutely wasn't going to affect children in big ways. Um, even herpes or syphilis or molluscum contagiosum, if I have an active herpes lesion, I, if I cuddle or um, hug a child, I can. they can get it on their fingers. Remember her pedic Whitlow? Whitlow's, yeah. And then remember that was when- a um, <laughs> Yes, that if I touch a herpes lesion as a healthcare worker, I can get it on my finger. Right. Doesn't mean that was sexually transmitted, but right. it, some of these STDs can be spread to others. And then syphilis, we didn't used to um, glove- with genital exams. And so a lot of healthcare workers had syphilitic lesions on their fingers when they were examining the mm. genitals. So we always knew that there was rare spread of STDs through other means. But it didn't mean that when schools were going to open, we were going to see big um, you know, monkeypox outbreaks in September. But boy, I don't, I'm sure you saw the coverage, that there was a lot of coverage that schools weren't going to be safe. Yeah. We needed a mask in schools, but yeah, mask masking to doesn't prevent, prevent sexually transmitted infections. <laughs> right. So... It was very hyped up, and I think that was because there was there was that same response in the COVID coverage that you wanted to increase fear to get more um, people to read your paper and to met, to get people to be compliant. But what did they want people to be compliant with? We needed to vaccinate gay men, and that's what happened. And now we're pretty much on our way to eliminate this outbreak in Europe and right. U.S. I haven't seen a case. We, oh, we were really hit hard because I direct an HIV clinic. Lots of um, mpox over the summer, and we haven't seen a case in four weeks. Yeah, so we're starting to see the the benefits of that targeting that population. Yeah, targeting you, is good public health. Do you think? And this is just speculation. Do you think that the media was too slow to actually say, you know what, this is mostly gay men that this is happening to, and that's where we ought to focus? And do you think that was because they didn't want to appear like they were stigmatizing the men who have sex with men community? I didn't understand that. That was certainly said. Like it's stigmatizing to say right. that someone's gay. But how is that stigmatizing? Like with HIV, we always said, hey, you're more at risk if you're a gay man. So let me give you some prep. Let me give you right. some condoms before prep. It was just very matter of fact, you know, yeah. to, to say, if you're more at risk, I'm going to help you. Like a obese child is more at risk for type one, sorry, obese um, young adult is more at risk for like type two, type diabetes. two diabetes. So yeah. let me put my focus on, on this population for type two diabetes, right. not like just saying everyone's at risk for type one or type two diabetes. You always focus your efforts on those who are at risk. It's just part of being a good public health practitioner. So it made sense to say, this is the population more at risk. Actually, I was very offended by that coverage in a way because I felt like there was very limited vaccine supplies. Yeah. And certainly a 10 year old shouldn't get it. A, um, a gay man should get it. So yeah. as someone who works with gay men, as an HIV doctor, I felt like that was taking attention away from the population who needed the limited resource. Yeah. Same thing with the boosters. Like older people need the boosters. Don't take attention away and also don't spend money, government money on boosters for tiny children when when my 87-year-old father needs it. That's and you, and it. you know what also? It's just logistical stuff. Like to get an appointment at CVS yeah. for a vaccine takes, it's forever because in the Bay Area, especially everybody's there getting boosters for their kids. Yeah, yeah, but and the older people The older it. people yeah. have to wait and yeah. they're the ones who like, you know, they actually need it. Yes. Um, or would benefit from it. That's right? how we used to, well, I don't know, maybe, I think that's how we used to do public health. Like <laughs> you're more at risk for cholera if you were near the water pump that had cholera in 1851 London. So let Snow, me take yeah. it. Yeah. So let me take away this cholera pump and give you cre clean water. Yeah. You're more at risk. Actually, the affluent people in the suburbs who oh. um, their Uber drivers were driving, the, <laughs> you know, the, the equivalent was people would deliver food and they stayed in their homes. Yeah. They were never at risk. They so this we there's been a lot of talk about this with COVID, the laptop class and the Zoom class. The people who are at risk were those who were out doing all the work. Yeah. So give them the protective equipment, give them the ways to stay safe until you get to a vaccine and give them the vaccine. And then we're done with COVID because that's what vaccines do. And that... Um, you know, is what this book is about. Actually. So that's a good segue right into the book because it's written, but it's not coming out until... It's coming out July 11th. It's called Endemic, a post-pandemic playbook. It's published by Mayo Clinic Press. And it's kind of based on everything we've been talking about <laughs> for the last, you and I, for the last two and a half years, because we started talking really early in 2020 yeah. in spring 
I can't remember. Were we masked or we were distanced? I don't know. Yeah, I think no, we, we were weren't. Distanced. No, yeah, I remember we were further we, apart. We, we were further. We did keep social distance. <laughs> yeah. And we were not so huggy. Yeah, in we those weren't as huggy yeah. as we are now. Yeah, now I we're like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it, it's everything we've discussed. So like seven chapters, but basically the first part really is an introduction to the book. And then the second one is how HIV could have informed the response. Because oh. that's... That, for those of us who have done HIV their whole lives, that really could have informed the response more, specifically harm reduction. This idea that what you do to control a pathogen is you take the populations at risk, you protect them, but you also figure out how to minimize harm on society or individuals. So if I had said early on in the HIV epidemic, I was too young, I was only 12, but like if practitioners had said, like Ronald Reagan said to um, gay men, You're diseased. Something's wrong with you. Stay away from people. That's actually was the conservative message. And um, and then the public health community went wild. They're like, that is a horrible way to message on public health. There's something wrong with you because you have a pathogen. It's not their fault. People get pathogens. So we are going to go away from that stigma based, that shame based, that, um, you know, kind of terrible. Everyone's still equally at risk uh, style of messaging. And we are going to kind of do tailored focused messaging. Here's how to stay safe, but please have your sexual intimacy. Please have your normal lives. And here's how the tools to stay safe. And then when we got treatment and prevention here, here, these are wonderful treatments and prevention. You're everyone's free to go. Just have your life, please. And use these treatments, please. And what we did with COVID is it was the opposite. (laughs) Uh, The current administration was conservative um, and people really didn't like Trump, the public health community. And so then they said, if he said open schools, we better close. We better close schools. If he says that it's there's an age stratified risk, like children are much, 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 much less risk for COVID. That's not true. A child is just equally at risk as an older adult. That wasn't true. That just wasn't true. It's never true. We knew that from data from Wuhan in February of 2020 that was covered by the New York Times. And that same New York Times reporter who covered saying children were really not at risk. This is such a blessing. Went on to become the New York Times reporter later for two and a half years that scared people about children. And I'll never understand it except that it was political. Yeah. And so it was really how HIV could have informed the COVID response, harm reduction. And then uh, the next chapter is just this kind of technical, I hope not too technical, but just all the greatness about the vaccines, the therapeutics, how much progress we've made in COVID. Amazing. Denmark, when they made the progress, they said we're done because these things work. So go please live your lives. Thank you for getting vaccinated. You're awesome. Had up up higher levels of vaccination because they said, if you get vaccinated, if you take these vaccines, we're done. And so everyone's like, ah, we're done. And then here we said, if you take the vaccines, you're going to mask. Yep. You're going to socially distance yep. and you're going to stay away from each other forever. That's right. And wow, you're what a get, motivator. It's a great motivator. <laughs> and not only that, but we don't know how many boosters you're going to need. Yeah. Eternal masking, eternal boosting yes. is, I think, the most, those were the two most negative anti-vax right. messages I could I could think of. They're, they're absolutely, uh, they're anti-vaccine messages, like you said, because they generate anti-vaccine sentiment. There was a meme that said, the thing about people who don't want to vaccinate and who want to keep boosting is, is a vaccination is never enough. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it's the same principle yeah. they meet in the middle. Yeah. Like you don't believe in T cell and B cell immunity and that that you can stop and you're going to be okay, you yeah. know, with your vaccines. You, you know what's nuts? So and and this goes right into it's not just the media, it's not just the pol- the political leaders. It's everything. Social media companies yeah. censoring people yeah. like Jay Bhattacharya, who was saying like, hey, guys, and, you know, sure, maybe Jay leans a little more politically right. I don't know. I found him to be incredibly sincere, thoughtful, compassionate guy, very articulate about his position. We have to talk about immunity. And he talked about immunity. He talked about immunity. I mean, that's actually my simplest message about this. If you know immunology, you didn't have to have this uh, hyperbolic response. Right. You just needed to get to a point where there was enough immune people. And then everything was okay. That's it. And and what's crazy is so like in 1918, you you continue like you continue to be on Twitter and say the most rational, balanced, and beautifully worded things that are f- so far from designed to incite division. And yet, some of the responses are like, uh, "Wow!" And it's really about them. But what I think is interesting about it is like even like one of the big attacks on you is like, "Oh, remember when Monica Gandhi said variants schmariants on yeah, Z Dog and yeah, B yeah, Show?" Yeah, that, yeah, That reporter who doesn't know immunology really attacked me on that. Yeah. I love that. He and doesn't know immunology. Not at all, and doesn't understand what you were saying either, which was clear, which yeah. is, "Hey, 
we have a vaccine that prevents severe illness. It almost doesn't matter what variants you get, even if they immune escape for infection, the severe disease protection is still there because of B and T cell immunity. It's just true. There's Move paper after paper. On yeah. with your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and T cells will blanket that spike protein from alpha to omicron. You are protected if you got vaccinated. For severe disease. Does it for severe disease? Doesn't matter what variant it is. That is just true. Yeah. It's paper after paper. That is actually the fourth chapter of this book. It's all on immunology, which I think that we really lost sight of. Mm. We thought it was only antibodies, not B and T cells. Right. The fifth chapter, I have to admit, is on schools. And what I mean by have to admit, it was very painful to write because any student of history, and I'm a student of ID history, it's just like my geeky thing. I've loved ID since I was like, I loved worms. I love, I can't explain to you. I love helmets. I love worms coming out of legs. I love ID. I've always loved it. I was always that weird. I knew I wanted to do ID before I, before anyone. And I loved it. it. Yeah. I just love it. And so if you're a student of infectious disease history, you can really look back and see that schools were always the places that you would close the least amount of time because of the need for children in schools. And I think you know this, but in 1918, there were three cities that were the most progressive in our country, New York, Chicago, and New Haven. And they were told by the federal government, we're having a pandemic, close schools. And they said, are you kidding? Nothing doing. These are 750,000 children in New York City were in uh, low-income housing tenements. And school's a place to look for abuse, to give people food, to give children food. And we are not going to close our schools. And you can come and tell me whatever you want, but we're not going to close our schools because we're progressive. But, <laughs> you know, we win opposite because Trump. But yeah. And so it is, a, I think it's quite devastating because now the harms of these prolonged school closures are so clear, especially, let's forget about the United States for a minute, especially in our, in India and the Philippines and Bangladesh, Uganda, who drove up, um, you know, the sex trade in, in young girls, drove up HIV rates, drove up Bangladeshi boys going and work for their family. They'll never work. They'll never go back to school again. There are now 250 million children that have entered intergenerational, multi-generational poverty because of this response of not being in school. School is the most fundamentally thing, important thing to get you out of poverty. So there's no, we can't, sugarcoat this. So it's all that data on schools. And then um, the sixth chapter is about global vaccine equity, which we've talked about on this show before, that why did India have a 4% vaccination rate when Delta hit? Because we're selfish in the West with vaccines and we need to work on global equity. So it's about global equity for therapeutics. And then the last one is a pandemic playbook for the future, using all these lessons of HIV, even the anti-lessons of COVID, kind of in a circular way, you get vaccines, you ease restrictions immediately, you never really focus on schools as a place to close, um, keep those open as much as you can. Uh, and then you de-emphasize like useless deep cleaning because that decreases trust in public health. You reassess testing and what's a true viral load, viral culture versus a PCR test that could stay positive for 100 days. And then you work on trust in public health, and then you come back to the top of the pyramid where you want to hopefully, you know, have more trust before we face the next pandemic. So, I mean, this is brilliant. I can't wait to see this. I hope, I hope people will actually yeah. use it proactively, right? For the future. For the I future. So, yeah. Because this, we we blew this one, like severely, we in, really especially blew in the United it. States. Yeah. I mean, China's blowing it in a different way. Yeah. But but, but we'll see in the end what uh, what all pans out. You're, you're pointing to the Nordic countries that actually generally did quite well. They did very well. Yeah. And they're left. Please remember that blue state of California. They, <laughs> <laughs> they did very well and they encouraged vaccines and- they just lived, you know, yeah, after they, that. They, they, um, they moved on the way that you were pointing yeah. in the beginning. And and the thing is, because it's been so divisive that 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 it is a moral palette thing, like, oh, well, if I, you know, if I have a moral matrix that kind of skews liberal, then Trump was so offensive. And some of the stuff they did in that administration around COVID seemed so minimizing and so careless and thoughtless that my care yes. versus harm moral uh, taste bud is really triggered. And my fairness versus cheating moral taste bud is really triggered. So I'm going to go all in the opposite direction. And so opposite that you didn't think of societal impacts on of kids. Of the societal impact. And yeah. even like, you know, there's stuff that you, there are second and third order effects of our response that are, uh, interesting and hard to quantify in advance. For example, do you remember the South Korean Halloween uh, stampede crush where all those young people were killed? Yeah. 
part of the reason there was such a big crowd is it was the first time in three years they were able to do that. So you've pent up young people who were safe from this thing. <laughs> what was so blessedly, as you said. Blessedly. Such a weird, to, it has to do with IL-17 and interference, apparently. Um, I think the best work of this was out of Albert Einstein. I would encourage people to read a Nature article that says the kids' immune systems mean they're all right. Wow. Yeah, that's the title. We're so lucky. That wasn't true of measles or mumps or nope. rubella or diphtheria or, or pertussis or influenza. Yeah. Always worse in young children, but it was just a blessed aspect of COVID. And so what we did was we did a backwards response and now when they're able to be young people again, you know, bad things can happen. And the mental health crisis yes, around that. Yes, uh, in adolescence. Substance abuse, the abuse at home that we weren't catching because of schools, all of that, like you said, probably made that chapter really Did you see that now suicide is the second leading cause of death in 10 to 18 year olds? That this is was just a report obscene. from the CDC last week. And even on Twitter, you'll see people denying it. They'll say, well, it's okay, it was a pandemic. How is it okay? Uh, they are, wouldn't have died of really? COVID. Yeah, they it's wouldn't not have died okay. of COVID. I think that minimization of the harms on society is because of a justification of the response. You wanna you wanna keep on doubling that's right, that's down right. Double so down. that you don't look like you're wrong that's as right. opposed to apologizing. That's right. And I think you know, that's the other thing about me writing this book as opposed to someone else. I'm pretty, I've always just been kind of really left of left in my politics. I'm really interested in poverty and social justice. Yeah, and, I saw, I, I, you know how I knew you were pulling up? I saw a Bernie sticker on yeah. your <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I can't, I can't get it off, actually. He's not running again. But there's, I'm super left. So I think it's helpful for a super left person because I write this line in there that I say, I'm left of left, but I'll never understand the democratic response yeah. to what happened with children. Because yeah. you, you, you know you hurt the poor children the right. most. You know you hurt black and brown children the most. White children, they're... they're um, rich, affluent families. They had tutors. They had people at home. They sent them to private school. We know that this is now documented by Harvard and other you know, major looks at this, that it was really African-American and, and Latino children that got hurt the most. So you know that you did it. So don't double down, apologize. You have to apologize. You know, what, what you nailed is that you can be, you can have the moral matrix that would identify you as left in many ways, like caring about disenfranchised people, the things you're pointing out, the old school progressive values. And the right actually applied those same values during COVID. They, they said, you know, this is disequitable. This is a, a regressive tax on the poor. Yeah, this is, they did. You're hurting small businesses that are not affluent and they're trying to, they're employing people at minimum wage and you're putting them out of work. And it's you, where the Democrat Party gets in, gets criticized for the coastal elite. Yeah. Um, you know, um, this was that a, hurling that question: Are we? Uh, is this party representing the elite only? Yeah, because the limousine the poor, liberals. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and and I will really encourage everyone to watch. Um, I don't know if we talked about this, but Michael Moore's 11-9, which explained how Trump got elected. And the reason is because what he's explaining is that the Democrats at the time were not representing middle America poor. And so is a not taking away taking away schools and taking away small businesses, not actually representing the poor. And so you're going to you're going to uh, rebel and vote for whoever's trying to help you because you're poor. Exactly. Um, so I hope that there's a realignment of values because the values are off. I I, I see since there's a shift actually, people are just in general waking up to a more, a view that's like yours, which is pragmatic, compassionate, actually looks at all the different consequences. It's a very nuanced view. I call it alt-middle. It's not yeah. political. It's yeah. like you can be on any of the spectrum and still have an alt-middle mindset, which is like, okay, all right. And and first of all, assume love for the other person that they're not an evil person. Yeah. But that doesn't happen on Twitter because Twitter is, everybody's a non-playable character. They're, yeah. they're just like a- So mean place. It's just yeah. super mean. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But it, that word pragmatic, that is, I love that word because that was what was happening with HIV after a while, after we got over Reagan and all that, like the public health was very pragmatic. Right. And um, someone told me once about San Francisco, it's progressive without being pragmatic, that you have to be pragmatic in your approach. How could you think that a highly transmissible respiratory virus that has 29 animal reservoirs and counting could ever be eradicated? Yeah. How could that ever be thought of? That's again, going back to student of infectious disease history. 
it's not smallpox, which was the only virus that could be eradicated. And next up, I hope, is polio once we get over the right. public health distrust. No animal reservoir. Because yeah. it's only has primates. Yeah, and a yeah. good vaccine. Primates, I see. Primates yeah. only is the only animal reservoir. But COVID will never be eliminated or eradicated because it has animal reservoirs. It looks like other respiratory pathogens. You can spread it right before you're sick. And um, our vaccines are great, but they're not going to uh, prevent a reinfection. We don't. And nasal vaccines aren't aren't there yet and I'm not sure they're going to they're going to ever work that'd be nice but we haven't gotten one for influenza so no non-sterilizing vaccine so four reasons we're never going to eradicate it mm-hmm. and China sh- should have known that in February and we should have known that in February of 2020 and then you minimize damage you yeah. first basically protect those who are most at risk you can do masking you can do uh, masking but it has to be those good masks you could do distancing you can do ventilation you can do contact tracing you can do testing they weren't very effective any of them ventilation i think is the most effective mm. non-pharmaceutical intervention moving things outside right then you get the vaccines and that's your way out right. that's your ticket out that's your key Right. And we didn't make it our key in this country because we were political. And so that's a nice segue into the last topic we're going to discuss, which is our division and our sense of meanness and our sense of separation from each other and our sense of, in healthcare especially, this idea of burnout, this moral injury, this idea that we're not, we don't have the resources to take care of the patients. The patients are adversarial, it feels like. There's this sense that there's violence at our doorstep. And you told me a story actually before before we even started the interview of your experience with a patient in, was it residency? Yes. Can you tell that story? Yeah, so I um, I came to San Francisco because I was really interested in HIV for my training, but I was also really interested in the county population and in really San Francisco poor general. population. So San Francisco general. I was general. a sub by when you were there. <laughs> oh, it was like that, that sub internship, sub internship at San Francisco general is like, it, it will make me cry. It, it was, is, it was all publicly insured patients public. or non-insured. And and so much HIV, so many disenfranchised people. So poor and, and, and challenging population, but so, so rewarding, like you just felt like a sense of expansion. I love that population and yeah. that is the population I've been privileged enough to be with my whole life. Mm. Um, so in residency, I just hated being up in the middle of the night. So this was yeah, um, I feel night it. shifts for ER. Yeah. And I don't know how people do it, but- um, The so mail ward at the, at the <laughs> yeah, general, yeah. it was called the MISH. The MISH. At the yep. time, remember? Yep. I and remember. now they called something else. But, um, and so I had to do the like 11 to seven, 11 o'clock at seven. And I dragged myself in, cause I think I was um, on Jeopardy and I had to go in at like in the middle of the night. Mm. And someone was yelling at me, um, he was coming off, um, methamphetamines and he was so angry and he was calling me so many names you, you know? can use the names if you want but. well he said he said f bitch See, i'm not even a big swear because i come from utah and then i think there was something about my color of my skin i'm sure yeah he was so mad at me yeah and um and at first i was looking at him and i don't know what happened i was really tired but i also like was was reading some vedanta and hinduism and and his face shifted and i just i saw him as god i just did i saw him as god and I was so privileged to be with him at that moment. Like I was suddenly not tired. I was I was just privileged to be a doctor. And I have been privileged to be a doctor, you know, in all the years that I've been a doctor. I can't imagine a better job. And the privilege comes from the privilege comes from illness and and being and seeing the person across from you as God. And that's where the privilege of being a doctor comes from. And I was on the other side and my husband died and the privilege of being a patient and being a doctor and we're all God. And I was uh, I was very moved by that experience. And ever since then, I have literally seen every I, I have never been offended if someone calls me terrible names. I'm totally into it. It's fine. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. It's God. It's God. We're just talking to each other. I I, I, I was so moved by that story because it, having recently been on all these retreats and all of that, when you experience the 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 face and, and the thing is, we all have different names for this. Like maybe the atheists are offended by the word God, but you could just say this. 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 When you see that face that is not other than you, like the same thing looking through my eyes and experiencing what I see as you is looking through your eyes and experiencing itself. And when you know that, it's one thing to talk about that and people go, that sounds like a Hallmark card. When you experience it like you did in that- Directly, yeah. Directly, you know it in your marrow, in your core, everything changes, everything's okay. 
everything's okay. Everything's okay. It's, it's all it's, perfectly managed. I, to me, I, I read Alan Watts in um, mm. India, like really hot. It, we went over the summer, so super hot. Try to distract myself from the heat. Reading Alan Watts, and he tells this story. There's this one essay where he said he had a dream when he was nine. And in the dream, he was strapped to a metal ball. And the metal ball was um, – uh, and he, was, he couldn't get out of this metal ball and it was hurtling around the earth. Mm. And it was extremely miserable. Like what an awful feeling, right? Dizzy, can't get out of claustrophobic, it. Claustrophobic. Yeah. Claustrophobic, awful. And he suddenly got this sense that this is exactly as it should be. And the metal ball broke into a million pieces and he was on the sparkling beach <sighs> and everything was exactly as it should be. <laughs> and that, it, it doesn't have to be God, like you said. It has to be that, just that feeling knowing. of knowing yeah. that this compassion for your fellow person. And, you know, Emily Oster wrote this piece on, um, uh, right before the, the midterm elections on, she wrote it for the Atlantic saying, let's have a pandemic amnesty. I'm sorry that, that, you know, she actually worked hard on school openings, but what she said is we didn't know enough. Maybe it's okay. We kept schools closed so long and it's okay. Let's just all forgive each other. Mm. It was a nice article, but, um, the anger on both sides was so polarizing. Oh. It didn't look like there were, like many people said, no amnesty for you, no amnesty for anyone in the pandemic response. And then many people, some people said we should have kept schools closed longer, but that's that's increasingly a very, very tiny, tiny position. Minority. That's yeah. a very tiny, extreme minority. And at this point, if we can't heal this divisiveness, not just about COVID, but about this idea of like looking at the other, looking at someone else and seeing them as you or seeing them with compassion or love. We are, I've never seen such a polarized response. It's very much on living in San Francisco. I see people so angry um, because they're not finding common ground somehow with each other. And it's, it. we need to work on this healing. Uh, 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 so, okay, I think this is, if we talked about nothing else, this is all that matters because everything else will click when you know it's all perfect. You naturally do the right thing. Yeah. And the, the way that, you know, the way that I think it's manifesting in the world now is we have religion, but we don't have God. We have meaning and belonging, but it's not true meaning and belonging. It's the meaning that's ascribed by tribe and by clique and by party and by this. So that's where we're finding our belonging and our sense because we no longer have a common mythology. We no longer have the hero's journey as our common myth. So we have to find meaning by going, I'm a liberal who hates Trump and I'm gonna do this, or I'm a conservative who loves ivermectin because my tribe loves that, whatever it is. Yeah. And so we find this a solution to the meaning crisis in things that mean nothing, that are but appearances. But we used to have meaning. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. well, number one, it's, this is the, the main point is it's fundamental to have meaning in life, right? Yes. It, like you need some meaning. And so we told people to stay away from each other for three years and there's this kind of depression, anxiety that came along with that. So then we weren't able to find meaning in like our human connections. We stripped away that meaning. Yeah. We took away probably the most meaningful thing of all, which right. is human interaction, right. primate interaction. If you're a primate, we need to be together. So we took that away. And now we're trying to come back together. I hope, I wish the mainstream media would let us come back together and stop saying, be scared yeah. <laughs> to come back together. That's very unreasonable to say that. But we had to come back. Maybe when we come back together, we'll get more meaning. But we, whatever you get your meaning out of, we need the meaning should not be gotten out of hating someone else. And we don't, that's kind of where we are right now. And I hope we can get our meaning back from the things that used to give life meaning. Interactions, if you believe in God, God. Some spiritual uh, practice. Some spiritual yeah. practice, quietness, um, nature, environment, whatever. It's gonna give you meaning, but we, we gotta get back to it because we're so mean right now. The, the, absolutely. <laughs> so just, I'm amazed. The, and, and, and even that meanness, even that division is is absolutely the perfect unfolding of this. But when you know that, the meanness goes away. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. The, 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 the motivator for the meanness evaporates into a sea of meaninglessness. Why would I do that? Why would I hurt myself? Why, you know, what's to push and pull on? It's all this. It's all and this. you know, what's crazy is so I just, you know, I recently got back from a hundred person, mostly medical people, silent retreat for five days in the hills of North Carolina. And a lot of these are doctors. Now I've had the privilege of being able to connect with them afterwards. It was trans, it's always transformative, these things, but this one was, there was something even different. And I talked to an anesthesiologist who used to hate being on call. Like it was like suffering, saw it as like me versus others suffering and texted me and said, 
I'm actually glad that my hospital is forcing me to wear a mask everywhere in the hospital. And I was like, why? And he said, because they won't see how I'm grinning ear to ear <laughs> about how amazing it is to be able to do what I do and have these <laughs> connections with people. And they'll just think I'm crazy. <laughs> 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 that is amazing. And that's the meaning, the connection with this this moment, each other. You know, and I felt it in you from the first time we met. There's something special about you. Other people feel it too, that you see that clearly. You've had to suffer through these terrible loss with your family. And the story you told at the beginning of your son looking up and seeing God, that is just it. That's it. You don't yeah. need to say anything else. It's we could have cut much, the interview right there. Yeah, we could have. <laughs> it's, 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 one does get dragged back into... The petty fights and Twitter can be extremely petty and mean, but it isn't actually about that because someone who's yelling at me and saying, you know, I don't like the vaccine or then they yell at me, I like the vaccine. I mean, I, I like, the, I don't know. I can't, I somehow I can't get it right. You know, like no, they you, all you hate could us. yell, yeah, they hate yeah. all of us. Yeah. You <laughs> could get, you could get, you don't, you're not telling me that the vaccine's killing pe people and then you're not telling me that the vaccine I, I don't know exactly what they're yelling them. about. Yeah, yeah, you need 20 exactly. of them. So, but the the issue is that that is, that is also people's suffering. And so they're yelling yes. at you yes. because they're suffering yes. in some way. And if you can just see people with compassion in that same way that that person in the ER became this luminous figure to me that day, that night, that two in the morning night, he was just yelling and he became luminescent because he was just – someone that I actually had the privilege of being able to give them something to make them feel better because I had um, medicines and I had like, I got to be a doctor. Um, it was, it was profound. And if I, if you can try to keep on bringing yourself back to that, then the person on the street that, that you feel like being mean to, or they're being mean to you, you can see it as their suffering and you can view them with compassion and then you're grinning ear to ear. You, yeah. I don't want to wear masks though anymore. So yeah. I'm not with because your anesthesiologist because I, I want, want people, people to, see. to see me smiling. I think we, we need to, again, harm reduction. We need to understand that there are harms to covering most of your face. There are harms to not being able to see the light in people's yes. eyes yes. and their smiles. Yes. So yes. that's especially for children. They need to see each other smile. So that's right. I wrote a lot about masks at the beginning but I was very clear if it reduces severe disease, boy, there's better part of reducing severe disease is getting the vaccine. Vaccine. It's how most of the world responds. Or the people who've already it. been infected and are yeah. protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly immunity. Right. immunity. Immunity. Immunity in general, which yeah. we talked about on previous shows. Totally works. That is absolutely beautiful. And, you know, what I tell people too is, you know, when you're so, when, when you feel that sort of triggering from other people, we were talking about this before the show, like, it's like how do you tolerate Twitter? Like, how do you manage that when people are attacking? You really have to realize that any response to the comments that, that we read about that are directed in any way is, is always us. It's always something in here that's responding or projecting or, 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 or whatever. And when you see it for what it is, which is just this, like it is suffering in itself. Yeah. yeah, or it's the it sense is. of the mistaken sense of separation, or the mistaken sense that any view is absolutely correct. Um, from the standpoint of reality, that this reality is perfect, multi variegated, and it's not only one way, and there's not just one science, and there's not just one thing. Yes, yeah, yeah you exactly. Said it. That's yeah, exactly it's right. Very beautiful. Reality is a magician. Yeah, it, it can do anything, and it spins up a world that has these laws that it violates on a regular basis. Yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah. Uh, so yes, so I'm hoping through your light that you bring to the world and this book and the way that you teach and talk from tolerance and from all the lessons you learned about HIV and AIDS and treating that that group and, and the stigma that we initially created and then we learned how to, how to manage better, that's true public health. Yeah. And that brings people together. And the conservatives that are listening and they're like, well, I'm not gonna listen to Monica anymore because she has a Bernie sticker on her car. <laughs> I'm hoping I, actually, I can't get it off. Right? I've been trying to <laughs> only because he's not running again, and I'm, I'm, I, yeah. I mean, I just want to. You want to replace it with a Trump stick? <laughs> <laughs> I want to replace it with a like love, you know, fellow man, exactly. and, and don't um, keep children out of school sticker. There, I don't know yeah, that's how to say one. that. Like, I like I, that. I, I don't you know, just said it. That's I don't know who represents I'll make that, that but that's what I want. Please there let them go. go to school. But even, even, even they would say. Wow, I see the light in you. That's exactly it. I and mean, we're all coming from this beautiful place of love. And when we see that, the winds shift and everybody wakes up a little more. And, you know, so anyway, so I told you, Thank I you. promised you that we're going to do like, we're going to try to set up a little mini retreat yes, here. Yes, I want to come yeah. so badly. I want to meet that anesthesiologist. Yeah. To well, see oh, his oh, he's grinning, he's like great. constantly yes. smiling. I love that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and yes. And uh, anything else you want to say as we run out of time? 
Um, I do want to say that um, I think anyone who has moderate point of view, you know, um, in either way is going to be attacked. But but um, but I hope that this book actually does come a playbook that we minimize the impact of society of our responses. We try to make public health less political. And we just think just as we do as doctors, who's most at risk? Who can I help the most? How do we harness our amazing biomedical advances to help people? And when do we just say that, like, this is what we wanted to achieve? And please have your life and please go back to what gave you pleasure and meaning. So I hope that this book could serve as that playbook. And maybe it won't, but um, but I think it's coming out at a time where there'll be reception to it because now we have HIV, we have covid and we will have something else. And we have to have a clean, reasonable, compassionate way to deal with it. That was pretty well said. I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Monica, you for it's having just me. amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Guys and gals and non-binary pals. Um, <laughs> I I just I had to do my usual end of show thing. Like <laughs> we're a podcast, subscribe, leave a review on your favorite platform, uh, YouTube, hit the notification bell, Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you listen to and uh, share the episode. That's the main thing. And if you wanna support us, there's ways in the show notes, uh, paypal.me forward slash ZDogMD for a one-time donation. I respond to all comments there or join our supporter tribe, zdogmd.com forward slash supporters. I sound like an NPR person. No, but I? you say it so well because you have such a mellifluous voice. I you couldn't know, even say uh, that. <laughs> you say the, it very I, I just remember like, like <laughs> when George Takai, uh, Sulu, in a Star Trek episode where they yeah. went back in time to go to San Francisco I and save the whales. Him, yeah. He's so sexy. He's and I'm so not even sexy. gay. He's so like, yeah, no, I he's want so be, like, good yeah. with the controls. I want uh, him. He's so good with the controls. I want him and to he, marry he, me. And he's flying into San Francisco and he goes, San Francisco, I was born there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, him and John Lennon were supposed to marry me. They just didn't know it. <laughs> they didn't know it. <laughs> I love it, guys. We are out. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. <laughs>